Good morning. Please open your Bibles to Philippians chapter 2. Wait, haven't we been there already? Yes? I am very grateful to uh, my dear brother Bobby McCreary for uh, uh, the survey he took us through uh, at Philippians yesterday. I love that sermon. Uh, Pastor Jeff also yesterday uh, took us to Philippians 1.21. Um, I, I know our theme is a a cloud of witnesses, but we seem to be spending a significant amount of time touching in Philippians, and uh, that's providential, I'm sure. I don't know why yet, but, but I'm sure that's, that is the Lord's doing. Uh, let's pray. Father, thank you uh, for what you've already done this morning through uh, the words that uh, were spoken by uh, Pastor Ruther. Father, what encouragement. Uh, to hear about that great doctrine of regeneration and that those of us who are, are born again have our assurance uh, in you and you alone for that. How, how wanting our assurance would be if we put any weight in ourselves for our own salvation. Thank you, Lord, for opening our eyes. Thank you for giving us ears to hear. Uh, thank you for drawing us to yourself through faith uh, in your Son. Father, as we look at the life of this lesser-known giant, uh, Father, from uh, the 19th century, Dundee, Scotland, Lord, I, I pray, Father, that as uh, I boast about this man, that, Lord, all of it would point back to you. Uh, Father, that uh, both my name and Robert's name, uh, Robert Annan's name, any other mere man's name would be forgotten, Lord, and that we would remember your name and your name alone. Pray, Father, that in the time that we have here during this hour, this session, that uh, you would be exalted, you would be glorified, and uh, Holy Spirit, that you would come and that you would work among your people, that you would move upon hearts and minds, and if that there is anyone here today, and you know, Lord, if there is anyone here today that has not received salvation by your grace through faith in your Son, that you would do so, that you would do that great work in their lives for your own glory today. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to begin by reading um, out of Philippians chapter 2, beginning in verse 19, through the end of the chapter, God's Word tells us this, I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon, so that I too may be cheered by news of you, for I have no one like him who will be genuinely concerned for your welfare. For they all seek their own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. But you know Timothy's proven worth, how as a son with a father he has served with me in the gospel. I hope therefore to send him just as soon as I see how it will go with me. And I trust in the Lord that shortly I myself will come also. I have thought it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother and fellow worker and fellow soldier, and your messenger and minister to my need, for he has been longing for you all and has been distressed because you heard that he was ill. Indeed, he was ill, near to death, but God had mercy on him, and not only on him, but on me also, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow." I am the more eager to send him, therefore, that you may rejoice at seeing him again, that I may be less anxious. So receive him in the Lord with all joy and honor such men, for he nearly died for the work of Christ, risking his life to complete what was lacking in your service to me. The Word of God. Now, I read that passage of Scripture, and like I'm sure many of these biographical sketches, they are... Uh, are going to be primarily that biographical and not so much expositional of a text. But as I was reading God's Word, even this morning, uh, being drawn to Philippians by what I've heard at the conference so far uh, over yesterday, and uh, having been drawn to Philippians 2 this morning, I see in both Timothy and Epaphroditus the man we're going to look at this hour, and that is Robert Annan of Dundee, Scotland. How many of you have actually heard of Robert Annan? Okay, not too many of you, not too many of you. He is relatively new to me uh, as well, and I am indebted to my dear brothers Jeff Rose and Robert Gray and Chris Sipley who are constantly 
putting biographical books within my reach of these great men of the faith, some well-known like Whitfield, who we just heard briefly about during the last hour and can't wait to hear more from Pastor about, about that uh, great lion, that great open-air preacher. Uh, but my dear brothers, uh, they, knowing my love for history, knowing their love for history, they have been so gracious and kind to me to point me to not only the great men of the faith, but some of these lesser-known open-air heralds who have as many, if not more, crowns to lay at the Master's feet than some of the great giants that uh, we often turn to for encouragement. And uh, earlier this year in March, Chris Sipley uh, blessed me by coming out to Southern California. It's very difficult to get evangelists to come to Southern California. I don't know why. Uh, you guys go all over the country. Yeah, I'm going to whine and complain for a moment. You guys go all over the country. You leave little old me alone in Southern California to fend for myself. And so, you know, you can do a West Coast tour. There is actually a West Coast. <laughs> yes, we call it the Left Coast in, out there in the land of fruits and nuts. But there are a lot of people that need to be saved. There are 54 million people in my state, almost twice the size of the entire country of Canada. You who do cross Canada tours, but don't come to Southern California. <laughs> But Chris came. Chris came out in March. Uh, we attended the Shepherds Conference together. We, we spent about a, a week in ministry together, going to college campuses together and other places, uh, and was greatly blessed by his, his time, his fellowship, and his encouragement. And one of the things he did for me is he put into my hands the Christian hero, uh, a very small work written by John McPherson, I don't know if John McPherson has written any other books. Maybe he has. But he wrote this book, The Christian Hero, a sketch of the life of Robert Annan. In 1867, the same year that Robert Annan went home to be with the Lord, and, and uh, I took that book and I read it, I think, in one sitting, maybe two. I'm one of those readers who has a tendency to read seven or eight books at the same time and struggles to get any of them finished. I don't know if you're um, jaded like me in that way. But this was one of those books where I opened it, I read it, I couldn't put it down. I've read it multiple times. And when we were asked to pick someone to speak about, to do a biographical sketch about, um, Robert Annan uh, was free and available, and I, I jumped at that chance. So I want to begin by uh, reading just a brief excerpt of the beginning of the book. I'll let the author, who was one of Robert Annan's best friends do the talking for me here in the beginning as we just paint a picture of his early life and his conversion so that you can have a general understanding of who the man was and then we will dig into his persona, we'll dig into his ministry, we'll dig into his philosophy of, of ministry, the gospel that he preached. And I want you to keep in mind, and feel free to flip to it from time to time to remind yourself what we read in Philippians chapter 2, verses 19 through 30, and see if you don't, like me, see some of Timothy and Epaphroditus in this uh, simple, humble, powerful herald of the gospel. John McPherson tells us this, Robert Annan was born at Hilltown, Dundee on the 5th of October, 1834. He was the son of respectable parents who sent him when a child to school. The boy was fonder of play than books and often instead of striving to master his lessons, he was contending with his fists, active even to restlessness. He would rise before the break of day and hide to the fields for sport to secure his Early awakening, he would hang out of his bedroom window a string, one end of which was fastened to his ankle. And at early morn, ere yet anyone in the house was astir, his companions came and pulled the string, and the sleeper arose. Fearless and fond of daring, he would plunge into the water, river, or sea, wherever and whenever he could, uh, the opportunity. He would bathe in time of frost or snow and quickly became an accomplished and courageous swimmer. He attained such ease and power in the water that he was named the water dog. And this mastery he successfully turned to one of the noblest uses, that of saving human life. As he grew up, the native wildness of his character developed itself with alarming rapidity. He became reckless, wayward, ungovernable, and fierce. 
Neither his master nor his parents could hold him in check. His, his passionate and lawless nature would frequently break, break through all bounds and spend its force in terrible doings, like the foaming billows upon the seashore. Yet amidst all this impetuosity and violence of character, there was something gallant and chivalrous in the man. He was kind-hearted and generous to a fault. Gallant, chivalrous words we seem to no longer hear anymore in our world as the world continues to effeminize its men. And not only the world, but the American evangelical community effeminizes its men. Words like gallant and courageous are bywords in American evangelicalism when they should be the first words to come to the mouth of those who, who watch and perceive and hear Christian men. It's a time for men. It's not a time for evangelical boys. It's a time for men. Robert Annan was a man. Continuing, at age 14, he was apprenticed to a merchant as a clerk, be he would not settle, but he would not settle at the desk, and after his time had expired, he served his father as a mason. Ere this had begun to frequent the tavern and speedily became a ringleader in drinking, swearing, fighting, and kindred vices, till at last he found himself in prison, where he lay for three months. Sobriety and sense returned with solitude, and as he lay in his cell, he resolved to amend his ways. Weary of his involuntary confinement, he prayed to God for release and foolishly imagined that the sincerity of his heart and the goodness of his resolutions were so meritorious in the sight of God that an angel might be sent, as in the case of Peter, to deliver him out of prison. No angel came, save the angel of justice. At the end of three months, Robert was free, but his good resolutions, like the green withs with which Samson was bound, vanished in the presence of the first temptation. He seemed now to be hopelessly gone in folly. A false convert. Robert Annan, a false convert. His father gave him a sum of money and sent him to America, of all places, where instead of recovering himself, he made a fresh start in the devil's services and played the part of the prodigal son in the far country. Although he had suffered shipwreck on his way to the new world and escaped death as by a hair's breadth, he no sooner set foot on land than he plunged headlong into sin, faster even than before. In his utter abandonment one night, in a freak of mad indifference or of wild despair, he threw himself across a railway and slept, escaping destruction only by some miracle of God's providence. His money was now spent and his clothes worn out. After sundry adventures, he passed from states to Canada, from the states to Canada, and during the rigors of winter, he went about shivering with cold and weak through hunger and want searching for employment, but in vain. Here he met a man who had pity on the forlorn wanderer and took him to his house. It happened that this man subsisted by rearing swine, of all things, and for time, Robert literally acted the part of the prodigal son and assisted his host in feeding the swine. Finding no suitable employment, Robert enlisted in the 100th Regiment, which shortly afterwards went to England and encamped at Aldershot. In the army, he met with Christian friends who took a kind interest in his welfare, tendered him good, good advice, and prayed and labored for his salvation. Wherever he went during his unconverted days, as he used to tell, he was continually met and followed by the prayers and loving offices of earnest Christians. This he attributed to the sovereign grace of God, which pursued him from hill to valley, till at length the good shepherd laid the wandering sheep upon his shoulders and brought him back to the fold. It may here be mentioned that his godly friends in the army continued to pray for him long after he had forsaken them, plunged anew into folly, and disappeared, nor did they cease their intercession until they heard of his conversion. For a short season, the stern restraints of the service, uh, together with the influence of Christian fellow soldiers and others, wrought some external reformation on Robert. External reformation. And being now employed as a teacher, he began to respect himself and be used, useful to others. Suddenly, however, one day the old spirit of evil obtained the ascendancy and he deserted 
disguised in the cast-off clothes of a peasant. With a tattered jacket, a boot on one foot and a shoe on the other, he pursued his way across field and through hedges towards London, where he reached in a miserable plight. His liberty brought him small pleasure, for he knew not what to do or where to go. Seeing a company of marines, he went and enlisted in the naval service for the sake of the bounty, on which he made merry and managed for a day or two to forget his misery. This didn't last long either. He had deserted because his regiment had been ordered to Gibraltar, and to be stationed on the rock he imagined would prove to him sheer imprisonment. And now his ship, the Edgar, was sent to that very place. <laughs> in this he marked the hand of, of that God whom he was constantly striving but in vain to forget. And from the deck of the Edgar he could see his old comrades of the 100th Regiment on the rock. He became extremely unhappy. Might they not discover that Robert Mackey, he had assumed his mother's maiden name, was none other than Robert Annan the deserter? Every time he saw a redcoat, he fancied he was about to be seized. Conscience began to upbraid him, till at length he was constrained by the voice within him to give himself up as a deserter. After suffering punishment for his offenses, he again resolved to turn over a new leaf and now thought he had done with sin forever. In his spirit, he wrote to his parents who procured his discharge, and Robert returned to his father's house seemingly a sadder but wiser man. One truth he well knew in one text of Scripture, he believed the way of transgressors is hard. Up to this point, that's all that Robert had learned, is that the way of transgressors is hard. Robert Annan's uh, pre-conversion life mirrors that of the typical false convert in American evangelicalism. Robert showed external reformation, which brought about a level of self-respect based on his own perceived goodness. Robert, in spite of his many vices and flaws, was well-liked, he was kind, generous, and, as the biographer said, useful to others. Even in the brief account I read to you about Annan's early life, we see multiple rededications. The turning over of a new leaf after new leaf without genuine repentance or faith in Jesus Christ. Annan was outwardly moral and outwardly debased at the, at the same time. Outwardly moral, outwardly debased. And those of us who are on the streets for any length of time, we see that every day, don't we? We see the, the professing Christian, the unconverted soul who's relying on their own perceived goodness and they are outwardly moral, making sure to tell us that we are immoral for what we're doing, and outwardly debased at the same time while they are in a drunken stupor with a beer in one hand telling us that we're pushing people away from Jesus. It's no different today than it was back then. He was violent and wicked, but with an acute sense of right and wrong. Robert Annan desperately wanted to be right with God while at the same time openly expressing utter contempt for the idea of being born again. He wanted to come to God on his terms. God doesn't negotiate with sinners, though, does he? That is until one night when he was called upon to fetch a friend from one of the many local pubs there in Dundee, Scotland. And he walked to the pub with the strength of character of a man proud of his new self-anointed reformed state. In other words, he walked to the pub with the moral superiority of a Pharisee, a scribe, or, or some other form of, of hypocrite. And he entered the pub, and upon finding the man he was there to escort home, agreed to have but one pint with the man in order to secure his promise that he would come peaceably, you know, being all things to all people, as American evangelicalism likes to tell us today. Well, one pint led to another, imagine that, led to another, and then another, until Annan was plastered. All of his good intentions, all of his noble-minded self-reformation were washed away in tanks of ale and the backwash of his own vomit. And the next day, unlike other next days, however, Annan's remorse crept beneath the surface of worldly sorrow, but he was not yet at the point of true repentance. 
He had merely taken a glance in his personal mirror of wretchedness, and instead of repenting and throwing himself upon the mercy of the Savior, he drifted into despondence and emotional and spiritual black hole. He was certain there was no hope for him. And oh, how easy it would be today to take a Robert Annan and say, join the Christian club. We're all in this boat together. Pray this prayer and everything will be fine. Fortunately, that didn't happen to Robert. Hopeless and depressed, but having sobered, Annan decided to attend a revival meeting in the Canard Hall. Now, this hall opened in 1858, just a couple of years before Annan wandered inside for the revival meeting. Canard Hall was intended to be the location for the local corn exchange. But it didn't take long before it became the, the town hall, the primary place in Dundee for hosting concerts and other festivals. And although today the spiritual climate in Dundee is but a shell of what it was in the second half of the 19th century, at the time Robert Annan decided to go to the evening revival meeting in 1860, the Lord was using the 2,500-seat auditorium for the preaching of his word and for the conversion of his elect. Annan listened to speaker after speaker, including Pastor George Campbell of North Free Church in Aberdeen, and would later tell friends that although he felt like every speaker was singling him and his sin out, exposing his sin, it was the preaching of Pastor Campbell that most affected him. Annan fought back his emotions, not allowing the tears he wanted to shed to fall. And as Annan left Canard Hall, a young man on the doorsteps implored him to make a decision for Christ. Annan walked away, the young, as he walked away, the young man said goodnight and then uttered words that caused Annan to tremble with fear. We shall meet at the judgment seat, the young man said. Yeah, that young man was bold and loving enough to shove Jesus down Robert Annan's throat. Annan changed his mind and decided to return to the hall for what was called an inquiry meeting, a meeting for those who wanted to know more about a relationship with Jesus Christ. But the doors to the hall were closed by the time he arrived back at the hall, and he could find no way in. With almost a sense of panic, Annan walked back down the stairs, leading away from the hall, crying out, Great God, am I shut out from salvation forever? Annan walked to a a friend's house, his friend told him of another entrance into the hall. And it went back yet again, but with the same result. He could not get into the hall. Around midnight, Annan ended up in the room of his friend John McPherson, his bi- biographer. Annan looked at his friend who thought, Annan thought, or rather McPherson thought, by Annan's visibly shaking body and unhinged demeanor that Annan was going to beat him for some unknown prior offense. And then Annan asked a question. Annan asked the question every Christian should long to hear every day of his or her life. What must I do to be saved? McPherson shared the gospel with Annan. But Annan left McPherson's room yet unconverted. Annan spent spent the entire night searching through hills and woods for peace with God, praying, beseeching, imploring. And as he traveled, it was as if the voice of Satan was directing him from one spot to another, specific places where he would engage in specific sins and reminding him over and over again, there's no hope for you. You've done this, you've done this, you've been here, you've done this. There's no hope for you. And then finally went home, but instead of going into the house, he headed to the hayloft in the barn where he stayed for the next 13 hours hours on his face before God until his parents and sister found him. But Annan could not be comforted. He refused food and drink for the next three days as he continued to beg God for mercy. And when John McPherson and Pastor Campbell were made aware of the situation, they climbed into the loft to talk to Annan. In doing so, they discovered Annan had been seeking and waiting for a sign from heaven to indicate he had been forgiven his sins. Annan's godly friends explained to him that forgiveness is received by faith when one repents and believes the gospel. They urged Annan to put aside his seeking and to simply believe the gospel. 
Yet by the time the two men left Anna's side, he again remained yet unconverted. But by the end of the three days Anna spent in the loft, he took hold of Christ receiving salvation by the grace of God alone, through faith alone, in Jesus Christ alone. And the man who spent as many years in wanton, self-righteous, hair-on-fire rebellion against God as David Brainerd had spent living his life on earth, Anna would spend the last seven years, only seven years, The last seven years of his life, serving Christ with a love for God and a love for people that dwarfed his pre-conversion debauchery and licentiousness. This was a Saul to Paul conversion. McPherson, again, who is Annan's biographer, wrote, quote, it is not possible to have bowels of compassion or to walk in the footsteps of Jesus And behold, with cold indifference, the great crowd of the unsaved sweeping past to hell. It is not possible, McPherson said. But yet most of American evangelicalism lives comfortably, not with the mere possibility, but the assurance that you could be saved while walking past masses of unsaved people bound for hell. Brother Jeff used a really strong word yesterday when mentioning things that I have said about American evangelicalism. For the record, I hate American evangelicalism. So let it be written, so let it be done. I hate American evangelicalism. I love American evangelicals. But I hate the system. It is not Christian. American evangelicalism is not Christian. A remnant of the Bride of Christ resides within American evangelicalism. And the Bride is beautiful. You will not hear me talking badly about the church. That would be like some strange man walking up to me with my wife in my arm and daring to insult my wife in my presence. It would be a less than sanctifying moment for me and an eye-opening experience for him. No, I don't speak badly about the Bride of Christ, but American evangelicalism, my friends, is not the Bride of Christ. The Bride of Christ is inside American evangelicalism, and American evangelicalism is, in many ways, as Jeff mentioned yesterday, a cult that worships at the throne of men, that worships Jesuses created in the imaginations of men. American evangelicalism as a system is as far from Jesus Christ as the Roman Catholic Church. But I digress. McPherson said it's not possible. And I, like so many Christians, immediately began telling people about Jesus after receiving the gift of salvation. I I alienated just about everyone I knew And while some may say I was a gentle bull, if there is such a thing, I was about as graceful and welcomed as an untamed bull in a china shop. I knew just enough to be dangerous. I knew I was saved, but I couldn't articulate it much beyond uttering those three important words, I am saved. I I knew without salvation in Christ, people would go to hell, but couldn't articulate it beyond five simple important words, you need to be saved. And my immature evangelistic zeal was soon tempered by the social mores of American evangelicalism. I learned that as you become more mature in your faith, you should be less vocal about it. You know, build relationships. Let people see Jesus in me. Live my life in such a way that people ask me why. Let my little light shine. Well, what I would learn years later, thank God, thanks to men like Ray Comfort, to whom many of us are in debt in one way or another, is that the more I thought about letting my little light shine, the dimmer my light grew. It dimmed to the point of being visible only to the Christians I knew, and their lights weren't any brighter. A burning candle became little more than a smoldering wick. Over time, like most American evangelicals, I became content with little light and hardly any heat. 
And what was so crippling about my spiritual condition was that I thought I was fine. I thought I was evangelistic. I was involved in evangelistic ministry to my brothers and sisters behind the badge. I did care about where my law enforcement brethren would spend eternity, but tragically I was so led astray by American evangelicalism's philosophies of evangelistic ministry that I thought I was doing something extraordinary when on those rare occasions I opened my mouth to communicate the gospel when in reality I was only experiencing a moment of obedience in a life of disobedience. And again, I credit Ray Comfort in large part for pulling me from the delusional smoke and mirrors of American evangelicalism. The difference between Robert Annan of Dundee, Scotland and most American evangelicals today is that Annan's evangelistic light never dimmed, never flickered. The opposite was true. While he was rough, even jagged around the edges, while he was the proverbial bull in a china shop for all seven years of his Christian life, uh, even as a relatively new convert, and, and, and had that military persona, both the light and the heat of his faith and his gospel proclamation intensified day by day. His evangelistic life did not experience the second law of thermodynamics. It was in opposition to that law. Because Robert Annan was a miracle like each person here who was born again in Christ. He was a miracle. He confounded the laws and wisdom of men and his light burned brighter and grew hotter every day of his life. Of Annan's immediate post-regeneration evangelistic efforts, McPherson wrote, quote, Robert Annan began to employ his talent in the master's service on the very day of his conversion. Give me some tracks, he said after telling me how he had found salvation through the blood of the Lamb. I wish to do something for Christ. And that night he took his stand at the door of the hall, that same hall, Canard Hall, This time, though, he took his stand at the door of the hall uh, in which a skeptic was to lecture against the religion of Jesus and the revelation of God and distribute his tracts amongst those who entered fearing not to testify for the truth. Whilst his very face, radiant with joy of salvation, preached the gospel to all who knew him. In 1862, Not long after coming to faith in Christ, Anna married and became a missionary with the Northeast Coast Mission. Now, as I'm sure some of you have experienced, I've been contacted by many brothers in Christ over the years about entering into full-time evangelistic ministry. And, And I'm quite certain what I'm about to say will be used against me, maybe by not anyone here, but some who may hear this later on. It's going to happen. History does repeat itself. I wish Christians would stop seeing full-time ministry as leaving their secular jobs and struggling to survive by eking out an existence and relying on God to meet all of their needs through the generosity of Christians. And I know what some of you are thinking. Wait a minute. What? Tony, that's how you live. Yeah, that's true. That's true. I'm actually encouraging you to consider not doing what I do. Now, I wish, now all of my kids are grown, and yes, I I just married off my first of my three adult daughters on Saturday. Um, I'm still trying to adjust to that, but I'm not going to take any time talking about that. We'll be here all day. Now that our kids are adults, Maria's working part-time outside the home. I, I make a few extra bucks here and there writing copy for websites of small businesses, little tent making that way. And, and we do regularly shake the evangelical bushes for financial support from churches and individual Christians. I'm not ashamed of that. I don't make any apologies for that. But people like me and, and, and many of our dear brothers who are, are gathered here, we are not the norm in evangelistic ministry. We are the exception. Now, let me qualify that word. We are the exception, not in the sense we are exceptional or special. We are the exception in that very few men will live as we do. Living the life of an open-air preacher who is not, as the world would say, or even the church, gainfully employed in either pastoral ministry or in the secular business world. There are few people who live like we do, and there probably should be a few less. 
probably should be a few less. During last year's conference, while not planning to, I did my best to destroy the false imagery that the life I and other evangelists here live, destroying that lie that it's a glamorous one. Now, I don't plan on putting you through that again if you were here last year, so you could breathe. There were those in the street evangelism community, however, sadly, who were so offended by what I said last year that they attributed my words to a work of Satan. I wanted to dispel the myth that full-time evangelistic ministry was a life of joyful adventure with nothing but majestic peaks and no valleys. I wanted to dispel the idea of a rock star class of evangelists, quite frankly, a false and sinful image I probably had something to do with creating. And I wanted to dispel this false notion that in order to be in full-time ministry, you had to quit your job and struggle to survive. For every George Whitfield or John Wesley, there are a hundred Robert Annans. For every full-time street evangelist today, there are a thousand men and women of God who are every bit as committed to evangelism and serve Christ in the context of what most would consider a quote-unquote normal life. You don't have to quit your job to be in full-time ministry. And if you only see full-time ministry as quitting your job and and going out to eke in existence and, and focusing most of your attention on doing evangelism, your evangelistic mindset, your view, your eyesight is myopic. It is too small. You are not thinking globally about evangelism, if you think you have to quit your job, that you have to live, leave the security of your occupation in order to serve Christ all the time. You don't have to do that. Serve Christ in the context of the life that God has given you. Be content. Imagine that. Be content with who you are and where God has put you. Be content with who Christ has made you. Maybe you will be the boiler room operator like Saiten Brugenkate who will leave all of that behind, leave the security of that job behind to go out and to be a street preacher and apologist for the glory of Christ. Maybe so. Or maybe you will be the boiler room operator who will retire there after 40 or 50 years and you were a bright light for Christ because you didn't keep your mouth shut in the boiler room. Guess what? You're in full-time ministry. McPherson wrote this. Quote, Robert Annan loved best to work for daily bread in some honest calling and to spend his leisure in seeking the salvation of the lost. From this period until the day of his death, he he was hardly an hour unoccupied. His strength was great and his powers of endurance marvelous. He had occasion often to rise to his work at four o'clock, and instead of taking rest in the evening, he would go out to address a meeting or to speak in the street. Sometimes he was so weary that on his way home to his meals, he found it necessary to seat himself on some doorstep and rest. Yet no sooner had he taken his supper than he went to his knees for half an hour and then, Bible in hand, took his way out to the blessed work of winning souls. Often, although exhausted with the duties of the day, did he, with another like-minded, run all the way some two miles to Lockie, where he conducted services. And as they sped across fields with breathless haste, sinking to his knees in mud almost at every step, his companion was frequently well night feigning ere they reached the place of the meeting. And on returning home at a late hour, it was often not to rest, for moved with compassion on the lost, he would lay himself down before the Lord and weep and pray a great part of the night. Some men want to go into quote-unquote full-time evangelistic ministry because they're lazy. What? Yeah, some men want to go into full-time evangelistic ministry because they're lazy. Because they're too tired after they get home from work to hit the streets with gospel tracts or to preach the gospel in the middle of the night. They're too tired. They need their eight hours of sleep. So how do I get around this? I'll quit my job. 
That way, I can wake up at 10 or 11 o'clock in the morning and, and go hit the streets and still get my eight hours of sleep while serving Jesus. Yeah, some men want to quit their jobs because they're lazy slaps. And they need to repent of their laziness before they even think of going out and serving Christ on the streets. If there's a man here who is contemplating full-time ministry, I, I certainly don't want to squash that, quench that. I don't know you or your life. But consider why. Is it really to go out and serve Christ full time? Or is it to make serving Christ more convenient? Is it so that you can expend yourself day in and day night, exhaust yourself day in and day night, day in and, and, and night? Or is it to make it easier to do evangelism? I'll quit my job. I'll put my family's security at risk because I really love evangelism and work is boring. I just want to be out there all the time like Tony and those other guys. This isn't for you. This isn't for you. Repent of your laziness, work hard where the Lord has you, and go out after work. Get up extra early to pray. Learn to live on five hours of sleep instead of eight. Have one of Jeff's special coffees to keep you going. <laughs> Robert Annan, probably the brightest evangelical light in Dundee, Scotland in the mid-19th century, was a blue-collar man. His hands hard and chapped from working daily with either brick and mortar or working on the docks, his voice hoarse and tired from nightly gospel heraldry in the streets and one-to-one -one conversations on stoops and in alleyways, his knees sore and swollen from intense times of prayer during the wee hours. And sadly, there are some great men of the faith from generations and ages past who were wonderful pulpiteers and open-air preachers but failed miserably in the home. I talked last year about making evangelism your mistress, your whore, committing adultery against your wife with the mistress being evangelism. We won't do that again today. Well documented is the family life of theologian and evangelist A.W. Tozer. His wife, Ada, and their seven children, all adults by the time of Tozer's death, would reveal that they barely knew their husband and father. Ada has been reported to have said after Tozer's death, quote, my first husband belonged to God, my second husband belongs to me, end quote. For all of his theological greatness, Tozer failed to realize that his first ministry was his wife and children. Robert Annan did not fall prey to making evangelism his mistress, like some men have done with their street and public ministries, at least what I've seen over the last 15 years of ministry. He loved his wife, Annan loved his wife and children, not only in word, but also in deed. He did not sacrifice his family on the altar of evangelistic ministry. Robert Annan was in full-time ministry with his mission field consisting of his home, his workplace, and the streets of Scotland. He was in full-time ministry, working 40, 50, 60 hours a week on the docks, and then laboring at home to love his wife and to love his children and raise them in the fear and admonition of the Lord. He was in full-time ministry. According to McPherson, and let's take now a, a quick look uh, at the philosophy of ministry and the preaching of this lesser-known herald. According to, to McPherson, Robert Annan did not often apologize to his audience, but sometimes, as I find from certain notes, he defended street preaching this way. I come out to speak to you because, one, I tremble to think of your present unhappy condition as sinners. God is angry with the wicked every day, Psalm 711. Two, I wish to prevent your future ministry. Quote, it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God, Hebrews 10:31. Three, I wish you to enjoy the pleasures of religion, both in this world and in the next. Wisdom's ways are ways of pleasantness and all her paths. Or peace, Proverbs 317. 
I wish to see souls saved, number four, because it is for the glory of God. Glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace, goodwill toward men, Luke 2.14. Number five, I wish it for the good of others, for when once you are saved, you will be a blessing to your friends and others. Come and hear all ye that fear God, and I will declare what he hath done for my soul, Psalm 66.16. Number six, I, I do it for my own sake, for it brings me great happiness to labor for the salvation of my fellow men. In wa watering others, we are watered ourselves, Proverbs eleven twenty five. Annan was ever ready to lend his hand, his heart, and his voice when good was to be done. If someone was drowning, he plunged into the water and risked his own life to rescue another. It is documented that he saved multiple lives diving into lakes and streams and rivers to pull people from death. If someone was drowning, he plunged into the water, risked his own life to rescue them. Poor, starving creatures he has taken home and, and shared with them his, his own humble meal. If he could induce a wretched prostitute to leave her ways, he would write letters and entail on himself any amount of care and trouble to secure, if possible, her recovery. For the good of the body or soul of, of any fellow creature, he was ever prepared to deny himself. But his chief delight was to preach in the street. The poor souls with whom he, uh, no man cared for were his great care. For them he wept and prayed and spent himself. God has given me a thirst for saving poor drunkards and harlots, said he. And truly it was a thirst intense and blessed. And the drunkards and harlots gathered in crowds to hear him. Rough as was his voice and manner, the intense earnestness of the man, the fervor of his prayers, the tenderness of his heart, gushing out in tears as he spoke of Jesus saving the chief of sinners. The disinterested, that's a tough word, disinterestedness of his labors and the genuine warmth of his soul attracted and won the esteem of the poor, ragged, pale-faced, ill-conditioned stragglers on life's highway who seemed to themselves, if not also to others, to be outside the pale of light and purity and hope. Annan was a man of great faith. He knew that the God who had opened his own eyes and saved his own soul could save the worst of sinners. Friendship, friendship evangelists don't do this. Relationship evangelists don't do this. You will not see friendship evangelists in Camden, New Jersey. You will not see them through the neighborhoods I've been driven through here in Philadelphia. You won't see them on Hollywood Boulevard pulling needles out of someone's arm and saying, could I, could I start a long-term, no-strings-attached relationship with you and hear your story? Friendship evangelism, my friends, is American evangelicalism's way of It's American evangelicalism way of justifying discrimination. Friendship evangelism is James chapter 2. You look like me. You look like someone I want to be a friend with. Come. Sit up here in front. I don't ever see myself having a relationship with you. Why don't you just sit here at my feet? Friendship evangelism is discrimination of the worst order. It's pride. It's arrogant. It's haughty. It's a false notion that God needs our help. That the gospel will be more pleasing, more palatable, if they have me. It's a detestable lie. Robert Annan was a true friend of sinners. He didn't go out looking for people like him. He didn't go out looking for people that he would feel comfortable having in his home. He pursued sinners. No matter what they looked like. No matter what their life was like. He loved the people who hated him. American evangelicals love the people who love them. And so they go out of their way to make themselves lovable to the masses. It's detestable. It is truly detestable. 
Rob, Robert Annan's open-air preaching was always manly and occasionally perceived as somewhat coarse because of his deep, penetrating voice and military bearing. But the more he preached, the more people saw him as kind-hearted. He was consistent. He was in the same ponds day in and day out. The more I read about Robert Ann and the more I, I study about this man's life, the more I see the inconsistency in my own ministry. I, I travel quite a bit, like many of my brothers here, maybe, uh, probably not as much as some here. I'm, I'm only gone 100 days out of the year. I have not spent enough time cultivating ponds in my own backyard. I have places I like to go, but I've lacked consistency. I've, I've lacked the consistency of being in one place day in and day out. I think of, I think of, uh, I think of Brother Jeff and Dave and their, and, and their consistent ministry in Camden. I, I think of Bobby's consistent ministry in Athens. And, and obviously others of you come to mind as well where you are plugging away in the same pond day in and day out. Maybe you have a crowd of two, maybe you have a crowd of 20, maybe you have a crowd of 200, but you're there, you're consistent. You're day in and you're day out there all the time. And the people see it. The people hate you, they despise you, but they know you believe what you're saying because you're there all the time preaching the same message. Don't stop that. Don't become so enamored with travel. Don't become so enamored with, with trips around the world or trips around the country that you lose sight of your backyard, that, that you lose sight of your own community, your own neighborhood where God has, God has placed you. Be faithful. Be consistent in those ponds, big or small. Be consistent there. God will bless the work. And that's what God did for Robert Annan. Annan was meek, almost to a fault. When a heckler would hur hurl insults at him, using Annan's own life before he was regenerated as a weapon. And Annan would not present a defense. He would humbly admit to those accusations that were true, and on such occasions, when the very personal heckling was particularly intense and painful, as soon as he was done preaching, he would immediately go to the Lord in sobbing prayers of repentance, not dwelling upon his sins already confessed and forgiven, but realizing that the vestiges of his old man still trolled the depths of his heart. God blessed this man with humility to realize that although he was forgiven, the fact that he was now a herald of Jesus Christ did not change the fact that he was still a sinner saved by grace. And then and when, when people he used to party with, when people he used to get drunk with, when people he used to fight with would come to him and say, Robert Annan, do you remember the night when I was there? Annan would say, yes, yes. Yeah, I was wrong. God has saved me. He wouldn't, give, he wouldn't pridefully stand up there, well, look at me now. I'm an open-air preacher. Look at me now. Look at me now. I'm not like you anymore. Uh-uh. No, Robert Annan was humble. He would accept the retorts and the accusations and the heckling and the abuse from the people he used to run around with. And you know, upon his death, the people who had the most gracious things to say about Robert Annan were the men who hurled the most insults and bricks and bottles at him while he preached. Not the Christian establishment, although they lauded him too. But it was the people who for seven years despised Robert Annan the most, who shed the most tears for him when he died. Can that be said about you? Can that be said about, that can't be said about me right now. It can't. That's why history is so important, my brothers and sisters. That's why these biographies are so vitally important. There is as much to glean in a 90-page biography of a little-known open-air preacher in 19th century Dundee, Scotland, as there is on a, in a 600-page volume on repentance. And, and, and I am not making light of that 600-page volume. We need those. We should thank God for those. 
but studying the lives of people who actually lived the faith and took it beyond the theater, theoretical of a commentary and put it to practice every day of their life. Gleaning from those lives, my friends, is invaluable. It is a treasure. It is a treasure that is almost lost to American evangelicalism because none of these books will sell a lot of copies in Lifeway. And not to embarrass my brethren here, but we need to be thankful for men like, like Jeff and, and John Speed up in Syracuse, New York, who, who, who are, are finding these books and, and selling these books, not making a lot of money, okay? Their heart is elsewhere, but they are bringing these treasures back to us. I'm in debt, brother. I'm in debt. I'm in debt to the books Chris has handed me. I'm in debt to the books that Robert... To, to Robert for the books that he has handed me. I, I thank God for these tiny little works about these unknown men and, and, and some unknown women who are just giants in the faith. Teach so much. I, I'm out of time, aren't I? Am I close? How am I doing? Anybody know? Am I right? Okay. Oh, well, he's kind of going like, yeah, okay. I'll wrap, I'll wrap up here. There's something else that Robert Annan did that, that many of the great open-air preachers of old did. Uh, it, it was a, a form of evangelism, really an art form, that is all but lost today, thanks to our iPhones and our tablets and our computers. Letter writing. Letter writing. With your hand, with your shaky hand, and your terrible curse of penmanship, letter writing. That was a huge evangelistic tool in, in the lives of George Whitfield and, and, and Charles Wesley and uh, our, our John Wesley and Charles Spurgeon and men like Robert Annan. They wrote letters. They wrote great, beautiful, pleading letters, not only to encourage their Christian brethren, but to lost souls begging them to repent and believe. There are a few things as personal and intimate as opening up an envelope and pulling out a handwritten letter written just to you. Wow. As I've been studying the, the lives of these godly men, I, I've tried to start to incorporate that in my own ministry, to, to send people notes, to put a stamp on an envelope, to, a word of encouragement, something. And the, and the response is, is amazing. I mean, there's nothing really eloquent in what I'm writing. There's not, but, but the response to, to receiving something as intimate as a card in the mail, written in your own hand, with your own signature, not your autograph, your, your own signature, that means a lot to people. Robert Annan understood this. Here's the last red letter he ever wrote. July of 1867, shortly after his, or before his death. Dear friend, my dear friend, Annan began. This is written to an unbeliever. My dear friend, I write you this day about Jesus, the Savior of poor sinners like you and me. I do not see any reason why you should not be washed in his blood, but that which every other careless sinner has. You have cost me more tears than many I trust not in these for any good to you, but I do trust in Jesus that he will save you. Remember, dear Elizabeth, this was a prostitute, by the way. Remember, dear Elizabeth, that more are praying for you than men or even your dear mother, brother, or others. Jesus is at the Father's right hand pleading for you. And the reason why you are not in hell Suffering the vengeance of eternal fire is because Jesus pleads and says, Spare it yet a little longer till I shall dig about and dung it. Dear sister, what a dreadful hell yours will be if you go there. You will have to go forcing your way over a mother's prayers, tears, and warnings. Your own profession once made and the entreaties of others. Will not all this make hell hotter? An eternal hell. Elizabeth, think about that. Mercy offered now. Think about that. Jesus inviting you. Think about that. His loving arms open to receive you. Think about that. Elizabeth, I wish I could 
give you to Jesus. I will try to do it by faith. Will you not go to the dear loving Savior who bled and died on Calvary to save sinners like you from hell? Dear soul, will you resist him any longer? I am certain as I write this note that he will save you if you will but trust him. I ask you, dear friend, to go to Jesus and he will forgive you, taking you to his bosom where you will be safe forever. I am your real friend, Robert Annan. That's beautiful. So you get home from work after a 12-hour day, three-hour ride home, and you sit down while you're eating your bowl of Cheerios or mac and cheese. You grab a piece of paper and a pen, and you bring the gospel to someone this way. Robert Annan's last day. On the morning of July 31st, 1867, Annan rose at four o'clock and spent a long season in secret prayer. Some of the neighbors heard the sound of his wrestlings and remarked to his wife that Robert had been very busy with his God that morning. He returned to breakfast as usual, and after family worship spent half an hour in secret prayer, he then took a piece of chalk and wrote upon the pavement, Eternity, and on the gate, Death, and went to his work at the docks. Yes, yes, Robert Annan did chalk evangelism. Yeah! He had chalk, and he would walk the streets of Dundee. He would go out in the middle of the night, and he would write out the gospel on the sidewalks so that people would have to see the gospel everywhere they went because he had to go to work. American evangelicalism mocks men like this. American evangelicalism is not worthy of men like this. About 12 o'clock, a boy 11 years old fell into the water, and Robert, hearing the cry, plunged in to save him. Having reached the spot where the boy was struggling for life, he laid hold on him and bidding him hang on by his neck. He made way for the shore, but the current proved too strong for even the strong swimmer and two boats put off to his assistance. The child was saved, but the man of God went down. He might have saved himself by letting the boy go, but he did not do so. The self-sacrificing and Christ-like man would save another if he perished himself waving his hand as if bidding farewell, so says a spectator of the scene, and with a smile on his face, he laid on his back and went down. He died as he lived. He died, Philippians chapter 2, seeing others is more important than himself. He died, a man living in conformity to Christ, not in conformity to this world, showing the greatest love by laying down his life for his neighbor. And it will never likely have the place in history of men like Whitfield and Wesley and Spurgeon and Lloyd-Jones and others, but, and my dear brethren, we, we should find great contentment to occupy even less space than Annan on the pages of history. Too many of us set our sights on being the next Whitfield while refusing to live like Robert Annan while lacking the spiritual stamina, courage, integrity, strength, resolve, love, passion, and compassion of a little-known man like Robert Annan. We want to be Whitfield, but we don't want to pay the price of Annan. We want to be Spurgeon, but we don't want to live the life of Robert Annan to get there. So I commend to you Robert Annan. I commend to you the open-air preacher of 1860s Dundee, Scotland. I commend to you his life. I commend to you his death. I commend to you his character. I commend to you his humility. I commend to you his simple life lived with the intensity and brevity of a meteorite. Whether he was preaching to an angry, drunken mob in the open air or distributing tracts to the masses or engaging a lost soul in one of Dundee's small, darkened wains or writing the gospel in chalk on the pavement, Robert Annan gave 110% in every evangelistic endeavor. He never saw any gospel opportunity as too small or beneath him. How many times, brothers... Have we seen the gospel tract as beneath us? How many times have we seen the one-to-one conversation with that homeless man as beneath us because we have a gospel to herald with a loud voice? 
And how many of you have come to this conference with this thought in your mind and in your heart, I just hand out gospel tracts. I just engage people in conversation. I'm a stay-at-home mom. I, I just hand out a tract at the grocery store. How dare you? How dare you use the word just or only in connection with the proclamation of the gospel? We are beneath the gospel. No form of gospel proclamation should be beneath us. And if you've come to a point in your open air ministry where handing out tracts is beneath you, where one-to-one conversations is beneath you, where you would mock a man writing the gospel in chalk on a sidewalk, it's time you stop preaching for a while. It's time you get your head on right. It's time you get your heart right before the Lord. And for those of you who aren't called to open air preach, please don't use the word just when you talk about the evangelism you do on behalf of Christ. Don't ever do that. Don't, I'll, I'll scold you. I will correct you. I will confront you. And I do that with people. If they come to me and say, oh, you know, I've watched your videos. I just hand out tracts. Th- there are a few things I hate to hear more than that. Oh, I watch your videos and I just hand out tracts. You've just, you've just made a video on YouTube more important than the gospel itself when you say things like that. Don't do that. And don't be an open-air preacher who discourages other Christians by by proliferating this idea that open-air preaching as noble and and as called of uh, uh, occupation it is is somehow a higher form of evangelism. We, we mock the methodology of men while we, put on, while we put on a pedestal our own preferred methodology. It's the message that's being communicated, not the method in which it's communicated, where the power lies. Whether it's in an ugly, photocopied, 200-word gospel tract or a 40-minute, eloquent message from atop a box, it's the gospel that matters. Robert Annan understood that. Robert Annan was a balanced man of God. The gospel was prevalent on the docks, the gospel was prevalent in his home, and the gospel was prevalent in his ministry. Let us seek to emulate the life and work of Robert Annan. Father, I thank you for the life of this man. I thank you for my brother Chris who introduced me to this man. Father, I ask for my brother and sisters to forgive me. I know I've run long. I ask my brother Jeff Durbin to forgive me who's coming next. I, I pray, Father, that, that my time up here has not in any way distracted him uh, and that he would not shorten anything he has to say because I have failed, Father, to be, to be pr- more precise with my words. Forgive me for that, Father. I pray, Lord, that we would indeed emulate Robert Annan, but only follow him to the extent that he followed you. That we would not put him on a pedestal in such a way that it would obscure your throne. But Lord, that we would glean from his life. That we would learn from it. And Lord, that you would use the life of men like Robert Annan and the other men we've heard about already and will hear about. That you would use the testimonies of their lives to convict us of our sin to refocus our resolve to glorify you and not ourselves and to be willing to spend our lives and be spent for your glorious gospel. In Jesus' name, amen.